Welcome to the Get Invested Podcast, where we share great conversations with experts from all walks of life to uncover their secret know-how and where they invest their time, their skills, and their money, and the benefits that this has created. You see, the truth is that everyone invests. Every minute of every day, we're investing our time, our skills, our energy, and our money in something. Some of us are investing consciously, some unconsciously, sometimes for good, sometimes for bad, and sometimes for no impact. Get Invested will help you to start living by design, not by default. I'm going to help you to make it happen, not let it happen. You'll hear the top tips on how you can live with conscious intent so that you can live more, work less, and leave a living legacy by investing now. Listen to the show to discover the top tips on how to get started, make the most of your investment journey, and ultimately, to be living your dream, not someone else's. More episodes can be found on iTunes or at bushymartin.com.au forward slash get invested. Thanks for listening, and now, let's get invested. Hi, Freedom Fighters. The beginning of the year is always a time when I like to reflect and think about the year ahead. What's in store? in 2019 and when it comes to investing everyone wants to know what's hot and what's not well the year is well underway and if you've listened to my special mini-sodes over the Christmas and New Year period you'll have already got a very clear handle on how you want to live and you'll have written down your three annual purpose goals your personal goal your professional goal and mostly importantly your passive goal. Now, the passive goal is the one that often gets left out. So to help you decide and think about how and where to invest this year, the next two special episodes will give you a range of independent property and finance industry experts so that you can follow and answer these very key questions. What's in store in 2019? What major conditions or initiatives will influence and drive the market and impact on property values? What are the risks? What and where are the opportunities? Where should I invest for growth? And what do we all need to do about it? What actions do we need to take on the basis of this information? What should I do as a buyer? What should I do as a seller? What should I do as an investor? And as a property owner? The aim here is to help you to make very clear and comfortable decisions based on independent and impartial specialist information, not not just rely on the fear-driven hysteria and misinformation that's peddled by the mainstream media that may help to sell their newspapers, but it does nothing to help you make sound decisions. So this week, we're going to start by going national, and then next week, we'll go local. So to kick it all off, we've got the pleasure of listening to two of our previous guests on Get Invested. Firstly, the voice of property here in Australia, Kevin Turner, and then a really good chat with National Buyers Agent, Josh Masters. So let me just refresh you on Kevin Turner. Kevin is the go-to and trusted voice of all things property here in Australia, And he's actually the most listened to host with his really well-known property programs, Real Estate Talk and Real Estate Uncut. Now, this success here has now been recognised as he's becoming the global face of property with his recent success with Property TV, which is viewed internationally. Now, in our very frank and down-the-line discussion, Kevin shares his thoughts on all of your key questions around property across the country. But he also shares his decades of experience with his secrets and what is fundamental, but also the top 10 things he's learned that are critical to your success. So sit back and enjoy this very open and honest chat with Kevin Turner. Freedom Fighters, the beginning of the year is always a time that we reflect and think about what's going to happen in the year ahead. And when it comes to looking at what's likely to happen with property, there's no better person to have a chat to than Kevin Turner. 
Kevin continues to be the go-to trusted voice of all things property through his real estate talk and real estate uncut shows, which are actually the most listened to property programs in the country. And he's now becoming the global face of property with his ongoing success as anchor of Property TV and chairman of Switch Media. So when it comes to knowing what's going to happen this year, Kevin's always my go-to person, so I'm very humbled to have him back on Get Invested. Happy New Year, Kevin. Hey, mate. Happy New Year to you too. And what a, what a fantastic intro. Anyone I think that I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> mate, uh, you, you've, get, you're, you've set the, the benchmark, mate, so uh, no, you, you made it easy me to follow. That you're very easy to write about someone who's bloody good at what they do, Kevin. So. Thanks, mate. Thanks, mate. Uh, Thank you. I just want to start having a, a bit of a look at what's going to happen this year. And, I mean, if we read the mainstream media, they love to keep us scared. And at the moment, it's a bit like listening to Henny Penny or Chicken Little, who's terrified the sky's going to fall in. Uh, as the father confessor of the country's best property and finance experts, because you talk to everyone, what's your view on what the, the year looks ahead? Yeah. It, it, it does actually change a little bit, and uh, I, I must admit, going into the end of the year, I was a little bit bullish about where the market's headed, but you've only got to look at you know, what's happening overseas, and we've really got to consider um, you know, what's happening in the UK, and I think, quite frankly, what's happening in the UK right now is even more serious than what's happening in the USA. And putting all of that aside, I don't want to get too political, uh, I, I do think we are going to be impacted by those things. Um, you know, we've got enough... Um, uh, challenges ahead of us uh, domestically, and we'll, we'll cover those. But I think the bottom line is that we're in for a pretty tough year. Uh, but it's going to be a year, if you're prepared, and I'm happy to talk about that too, there are going to be a number of tremendous opportunities for us. Um, you know, in, in our business, uh, Real Estate Talk, and you mentioned the Real Estate Talk and Real Estate Uncut, uh, we talk to a lot of consumers, investors, mum and dad buyers, first home buyers, and also to real estate agents. And there's uh, an emerging need that we're really focusing on, Bushy, and that is we need to educate and help people. Uh, they need to see what reality is, uh, both from a consumer point of view and, and agents. And the challenges here for agents in particular is how are they going to be able to communicate with sellers who all of a sudden are finding that the property they own is actually worth less than what they paid for it. And, um, you know, we're, we're off to the United States for a couple of weeks, which is a market that has been through that. Um, and there's a lot of skills that we're going to be able to pick up from what agents are doing, how consumers are handling it, how agents are talking to consumers and so on. I went through a very similar situation when I started in real estate. I started in the late 80s, early 90s, and we went through a situation there where we had to be going to sell to sellers or owners of property and saying, well, I know you paid X for this 12 months ago, but really right now it's actually worth less than that. So it's, it's educating and helping people who are going to be going through that that reality, Bushy. That's, um, that's my view on what we're going to be facing this year. Yeah, and I, it's a, I think you've touched on a very good point. And, and having lived through the same cycles myself, I, I think the, the good agents, and, and what, if taking a positive out, out of what you're saying, uh, for me, uh, yes, you might be selling a property, but nine times out of ten, those sellers are going to buy something else. And so they, yes, they may take, take a little bit of clip of the toenails on the, the sale, but they also benefit from that from the property they're about to buy. So from a changeover cost perspective, uh, which is ultimately what it's about for those that are selling and then buying, uh, it's probably actually a good time to be doing something, mate. Yeah, well, there's that point too, Bushy, but bear in mind there are some people who uh, will not be able to buy another property. Uh, they won't be able to re-enter the market. And this is these are the real this is the real sad part of all of this is that there will be some people who are going to be casualties in all of this. Um, you know, when I first started in real estate, I ended up having to deal with a number of uh, developers who really found it tough. They had a lot of um, inventory that they they needed to reduce, and we had to we had to nurse them through a situation where they were going bust. The bank was about to walk in. So th- these are the real challenges for for agents, Bushy. Yeah, uh, and and I think it does transcend into consumers as well. We need to be prepared for this. You can't yeah. just say uh, I, I, I'm I'm not denying what you said is correct. It is very correct. 
you know, you lose at one end, but you gain at another. But that is not always going to be the case, Bushy. Yeah, no, that, and that's a very good point. And I think the the take home there more than more than ever, Kevin, is that if, if someone's looking to purchase a property in the current environment, given given all of the uh, bank changes in policy that have occurred through progressive successions from APRA and ASIC and and now the Royal Commission. If uh, buyers haven't gone out and actually got themselves a pre-approval, they're probably taking a major risk. So even if they're selling a property, I'd be going and getting a pre-approval before I sell a property to make sure I'm actually in a position to buy the next one that, I, that I'm looking to do before I do that. Your thoughts? Yeah, uh, absolutely. There's a saying that, that I think is going to resonate with us in the next uh, uh, couple of years because I, I think you know, we're in for a bit of a tough time maybe for 2019, 2020, although it might improve, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But, yep. but uh, th- there is a saying, Bushy, and I, I'm, it's an old one. You will have heard it, but it is so true, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to come home this year, and that is that you make money out of real estate when you buy, not when you sell. And I think you've got to be prepared, even if you're buying in this market, you know, what is going to be the worst-case scenario? The big lesson here will be the banks. Look at how they structure their business. You know, they won't lend anyone uh, money unless they work in a very sizable buffer. We should be doing exactly the same thing. We should be saying, you know, we should be buying property on the worst case scenario, not the best case. Not holding our breath and hoping that everything's going to be okay. Because it probably won't. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's very sage advice, mate. So you've touched on the, the political arena and the fact that we've got a federal election coming up. Uh, it, it's got to be before May. What are the other key influences that you think are likely to impact on property this year, mate? Yeah, we're going to see the banks continue to tighten credit, uh, as they have done, and we've seen the impact of that and, and what that's done to investor, uh, in, 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 in investor sentiment, uh, investor activity. Uh, it's had a it's had a big effect. Um, we're also seeing them prepare for open banking. Um, you know, they're gathering a, a huge amount more data. And uh, you and I have touched on this in one of the interviews that we did for Real Estate Talk. I think that's going to be one of the things that we need to be very careful of is the fact that there is a lot more knowledge now that the banks have about our spending, particularly our discretionary spending. So we need to be very careful about that. Yeah. Uh, treat your credit like your credit rating is going to be vital. Make sure that it works really, you, you know, that you, you've got it very much under control. Um, yeah, you mentioned the federal election. I think that always has a play in, in what happens. Um, I, I've, I've got to be honest, uh, Bushy, and say to you, and I know you've expressed some concern about it, and I have done in the past as well, and that is the possibility that Labor will get in and want to play with negative gearing. Yep. Isn't it funny how... Now, on the, on the landscape of what's happening, that just, to me, doesn't seem to be as important as it used to be. It, 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 is, it is important, but not as important when you look at what's happening overseas and the impact that might have on us. Uh, so, you know, I'm, once again, uh, you're on record as saying that, you know, Keating gave us the recession we had to have and maybe Shorten's going to give us the one, that, you know, we didn't need, but... Um, you know, I, I do think that negative gearing is not going to be good for us uh, if, if they start to, if, sorry, if they change it in any way. Yeah. Uh, but the long, t- that'll be a more of a long term effect, not a short term effect. And I think, it, you know, in some ways, we're going to see a number of people, you know, if, if Labor do win, a number of people will be trying to get in before they make those changes. So you could see a bit of an artificial increase in the in the in the market as well, Bush. I don't know if you agree with that. Yeah, and I do agree with what you're saying there, mate. Uh, and I guess the I guess the concern I have is, uh, and it's it's leading to what you've said. It's all a little bit too late. I mean, all all of these policy decisions were made around. Uh, uh, when the Sydney market was going gangbusters and Melbourne wasn't far behind it, and it's now going through its normal correction. You know, it's, anyone who's been in probably long enough knows that what's happening now is is actually quite normal. But because they they've tightened the screw so much, and they're con- they're continuing to want to tighten the screw so much, it becomes self fulfilling. So we, we've achieved the the calming. I, I guess my biggest concern, if we continue to uh, strangle it uh, and and restrict credit, then uh, it can turn from a, a soft landing into a into a potential recession that's not very carefully handled, and and it's putting all these things together. Uh, and then, uh, my I guess my only 
uh, plea is that the Labor government gets out and talks to industry and informs themselves on what the actual position is now rather than relying on estimates done a couple of years yeah. ago before they yeah. uh, institute any yeah. major changes. Mate, that's cool. Uh, what else do you think is out there that um, may be influencing on us? And as a result of that, what are the – you've mentioned some of the risks. What are some of the opportunities that you see flying through yeah. this? Yeah. No, no, I think there's, I put it in two categories. The risks are that we don't prepare because, I, you know, once again, I'm going to say that I think we're in for a bit of a tough time this year, but if you prepare for it, yeah. uh, if you have the knowledge, and I'd be happy to give you some steps on what I think we should be doing a little bit later in this talk, Great. I think uh, if, you, if you don't prepare, that is going to be a huge risk. So just be, be prepared for it. The opportunities, and this is a terrible thing to say, Bushy, if I wrote it down, I'm going to say it, uh, the opportunity is for us to profit from other people's stupidity simply because they don't prepare. There are going to be some excellent opportunities, some wonderful buying opportunities in the market. If you've done your homework, if you've got your plan in place, uh, you've got your financing structured properly, um, you're going to be in a great position to just cherry pick some of those great opportunities. Yeah, absolutely agree. And, mate, uh, most of our listeners are, are long-term uh, buy or build and, and holders. Uh, so capital growth is a key driver that they're looking forward. Given your sort of awareness of what's happening around the country, where do you think they should be looking at this stage, mate? Yeah, mate, I, I, this is a really interesting um, question, a great question, because I think it goes to the core of everything we've talked about. But if for me, the, the smart money seems to be going to the regional areas. Look, look at the regionals. Don't rule out the cap cities by any stretch of the imagination. But it also depends if you're an investor or if you're a home buyer. And a little bit later, we might talk about, you know, what you should be doing in each of those categories. But, uh, you know, I'd certainly be studying the regional areas, particularly around uh, regional New South Wales, regional Victoria, yep. because, you know, while we're seeing Sydney and Melbourne, um, you know, extremely expensive, uh, there's still a need for people to live in those areas. So they're going to be looking at the more regional areas, provided we get good infrastructure in place in terms of, um, you know, travel. Uh, uh, as an example, Gippsland, uh, just out of, um, in regional Victoria, you know, some tremendous opportunities coming up there, very affordable property, uh, and the rail link back into Melbourne is just so super fast. So th- these are some of the opportunities, I think, for investors uh, to look at. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd also be looking very closely at Adelaide, and I, I am a believer in Perth. I think that the Perth market, is starting to turn around. There are some green shoots there. Yep. Uh, and now is a very, very, very good time to be looking at Perth. Whether you invest there or not, I guess it's going to depend on your risk profile. Yeah, I, I agree with you because if, if most investors, if they're investing for a 10, 15 or maybe a 20-year term, then you're not so worried about the, the here and now and uh, it's, it's never going to be cheaper than what it is in Perth. And, and you're right, I've, I've got a brother who lives over there and he's just started to see uh, his property values move in the right direction. So uh, there's some pretty healthy signs on the horizon. And with what's happening in the resources sector, while it's not getting a lot of press, it's, it's certainly starting to show some improvement. So uh, Perth, I think, is, for, for those that are a bit of contrarian and, and prepared to come in early and, and won't see much growth in the short to medium term, but the, the mm. fundamentals are pretty strong. They'll do pretty well there, mate. But let, let's go around the rest of the country, mate. So your hometown of Brisbane, which I've always been a massive fan of South East Queensland and, and continue to think that that's a, a great way and a great place to be uh, sticking your investment money. What's your thoughts around uh, that your location and, and Queensland in a broader sense, mate? So uh, you, you're talking there specifically about Queensland, are you? Yeah. Is that what you asked me? Yes, yeah. mate. Yeah, yeah mate, I, I think the, the Brisbane market, um, the thing I like about the Brisbane market, and we'll talk about it on its own just for a moment, is that it, it doesn't seem to have the huge peaks and troughs that we see in Sydney and Melbourne. It's just a fairly consistent market, grows roughly around about 5 to 6%, which means your property value is going to double every 10 years. Um, you know, I've been a great believer in the Brisbane market, um, I'm, I'm starting to liken, uh, like a lot more the Sunshine Coast market, uh, just north of Brisbane. Uh, you know, once again, uh, really good infrastructure going there, a lot of development, big, uh, big, uh, investment in hospitals and so on. Uh, and the Gold Coast market, you know, it, it it's solid. Uh, it did suffer from, uh, an oversupply recently, but that in, in the unit market, but that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. Still, a bit of talk, and there has been for about 15 years now, about an oversupply of units in the inner city Brisbane market. 
but we're now starting to see that come off as well. Uh, you know, with uh, a lot of developers having mothballs and development sites. Um, so, uh, demand is now starting in some parts of Brisbane, starting to exceed supply. So, I, I think it's a good. The, the Brisbane market's quite good. Just moving around the country. Once again, I think you know Sydney and Melbourne. I, I liken those two together. I. I, I do think uh, they're in for a bit of a tough time. I, I read a report, which I'll refer to in just a minute, um, from Fitch saying that they believe that the market in Australia was going to be one of the worst performing markets in the world in 2019. But that's largely based on what's going to happen in Sydney and Melbourne, which is where a lot of people uh, judge the overall Australian market. But I, I tend to think it's a lot broader than just um, just Sydney and Melbourne. So, you know, I, I, I think, and I'm going to say again, I think Sydney and Melbourne, unless you really need to be living in a city in those, uh, in those cities, you should be looking at the regional markets because I think there's a, you know, a lot of, a lot of growth in there. Regional New South Wales, regional Victoria are the two places, you know, I think they're going to do quite well. Yep. Um, Perth, you know, you've heard me talk about Perth. I, you know, I'm, I'm a believer in that Perth market. I think it is going to improve whether it happens this year or next year. It will definitely happen. Yep. If you're a long-term investor, it's a good market to be looking at. Adelaide is good. Um, I still like Canberra. Um, Canberra still surprises me from time to time. But a lot of that's going to depend on uh, what happens in uh, in the election later this year. You know, Canberra almost seems to go into a shutdown. Yeah. Um, you know, you've only got to go in there after an election and look at the number of vacancies in the city. It's just... It's all, it almost becomes like a like a ghost town. Yeah. So I, I wouldn't be as confident about uh, Canberra. Hobart, I think, you know, um, there's been a lot of hype about Hobart. Uh, I'm, I'm not an investor in, in Tasmania. Uh, I haven't been. Uh, but, you know, I watch that one closely. I, I think it's never going to, it's not going to be uh, outstanding, but I think it, there is a bit more growth in that Tasmanian market. I'd, I'd probably have a look at Launceston, actually. Yeah, I was going to say, I think Hobart's probably uh, almost had its run. It's had two or three years of really strong growth. Uh, it'll probably flatten out now and, and plateau for a period, but Laun- yep. Launceston uh, hasn't yep. sort of in- yep. enjoyed that, and there'll be a pretty good flow on giving the affordability there, mate. So there's probably some good opportunity in that neck of the woods. The, the good old territory, mate, is the, the one that we haven't spoken about. Uh, it's been very challenged because it's got a very small population and it's reliant pretty heavily on a, a couple of industries. Uh, but what's your view on uh, uh, what's likely to happen up in the top end? Uh, sorry, mate. I mean, it was at Darwin, was it? Yes, mate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah Darwin. Um, but I, I don't think I'd venture there. It's just... it's. It, it's not a market that I've got a lot of confidence in. Um, whether it's just too removed or it's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just I'm just not a believer in, in that in the Darwin market. Um, ne- never really have been, and I think we've seen it suffer a lot. Uh, I, I just I wouldn't I don't think that's where the smart money is going. Out. I still think it's down in the southern part of the country. Sorry to say that for, for those folks who live up there, but. You know, that's how I see it. Yeah, I would totally agree with you there, mate. Let, let, let's sort of switch now to, uh, you know, the buyers, investors and home sellers mm. particularly. Uh, what's what's your advice on what they should be doing given everything we've spoken about? Yeah, mate, I want, I want to draw a bit on my own personal experience here and I think, uh, you know, I, it's easy to talk about, you know, buyers generally, but I think they do fit into different different boxes, if you like, you know, the general home buyer, uh, you know, property investors, uh, home sellers, um, you know, and, and, and vendors. But let, let, the fundamentals, no matter whether you're an investor or whether you're a home buyer, the fundamentals should still be the same, I believe. But it's so easy to get distracted because I think, as you said in your opening, about the amount of almost misinformation we hear from some parts of the media where, you know, e- even in one publication you can hear about a boom and another one you can read about a bust. It's almost as if they don't take a view, they just carry press releases from people who want to get some front-page exposure. Yeah. So it makes it, very, it makes it very difficult for consumers to try and work out what the hell is happening. I think the bottom line for me is you really need to take responsibility for you know, what it is you're doing. Own your own decisions. Work out your own risk profile. Look at things like your age, your debt, your family situation, and your history. 
how's your history been? If you've had a bad credit history, you know, maybe you're better off just sticking your head between your legs for a little while and just, you know, waiting this thing out. So, and, and also, what do you need? If you are a home buyer, what do you, what you need should outweigh uh, a lot of the common sense investment decisions you'll make. It's about your family. It's about where you're at in that particular part of your life. And understanding, too, that if you buy a home for your family to live in now, it doesn't have to be your forever home. It's it's a home that may fit your needs for the next decade or so, whatever, depending on how old your family is. But then you can always sell it and move on if you've actually bought in a reasonably good location, an area where you think the resale value is going to be high. So uh, it's going to be it's going to be um, supported. Uh, re- remembering too, Bushy, no one size fits all. You know, I don't know how many um, interviews we've done over the years where we say someone will say, "I've got a winning formula here," and this is if you follow this formula, you're going to be a winner. It just doesn't work that way. You know, everyone everyone's different, and it really depends, as I said, on your age, your debt, your family situation, where you're at right now. I think, too, the other thing, um, you know, no matter what category you fit in, you've got to have a plan. What is your plan? Don't just wake up one morning and say, you know, I want to sell this house or I want to, you know, your plan needs to be very structured and and you need to follow it religiously. Um, Be patient. Things don't happen overnight, Bushy. This is a journey. It's not a destination. Um, If you're buying a home, uh, you know, don't necessarily think that the first one you see is the one you got to buy, or if you fall in love with it, you know, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to pay whatever I need to to get this place. If you miss out on a property at auction this year, remember there'll always there will always be another one. So don't be too quick. Be patient. Yeah, it's some some really good uh, advice there, mate. And if I sort of try and uh, sort of pull the gold out of what you said there, what I'm picking up is that. If you're a home seller, uh, then there's probably never been a better time to make sure you're getting a really good agent to represent your interests uh, because uh, yeah. it'll be the quality of the agent ultimately uh, that will give you at least your best chance of getting the, the best sale value for the property. If you're a buyer, yeah. whether that be a home buyer or a property investor, uh, you've hit, hit it on the head. Uh, credit is going to be tight, so make sure you get a pre-approval. Uh, but more importantly, and, and you've, you've covered this off as well, because uh, we are experiencing this with a lot of our uh, current clients and investors, mate, uh, the credit conduct is absolutely critical and in two, in two formats. You, you've got to have absolutely clean, clean conduct because you've only got to be late on one thing or have an overdue and that's goodbye. And uh, you've got to make sure that your expenditure over the last six months is pretty conservative because banks are now looking at your actual spend, not not averages. So if you've had a big Christmas and uh, overspent, that's going to impact on your ability to get your hands on the money to get a property. So make sure you do that. Make sure you get a pre-approval and then at least you're well positioned to take advantage of the uh, uh, good opportunities that will be there. Mate, your summary... uh, over and above that in terms of uh, other things that people need to take away from the chat today, mate? Yeah. Mate, I think the bottom line here is that if you've structured yourself correctly, you've done your homework and you can hold on, you're going to be okay this year. And, and I really mean that. If you've done all those things, you're going to be okay. It's going to be a brutal year, though, if you haven't done those things. And I'll go over them again. You know, structured yourself correctly, you've done your homework and you can hold on because... Uh, I, I think, you know, unless you really have to be getting rid of a property, this is not a good time to be doing it. This is a time to be building your portfolio, not stripping it down. I, I read a report today, just today, from Fitch Ratings. They for, they're forecasting Australian house prices are going to decline by a further 5% this year, uh, on top of a 6.7% decline in the peak so far. And that, they say, makes Australia, the Australian housing market the worst performer. Uh, out of the 24 countries for the second consecutive year. They they also said that a national decline of 6.7% uh, as of December was being driven by lower investor demand as regulators impose restrictions on interest only and investing lending. And, and it gets back to that point I made earlier, uh, Bushy, and that is that, you know, some of these triggers that we have no control over are going to have the biggest impact on us this year. That's why you need to be prepared. You need to um, 
you know, work on the worst case scenario, not the best case. I think funding this year is going to get harder for everyone, no exceptions. Yeah. Uh, even CoreLogic, uh, their December figures showed Australian house prices had experienced the sharpest drop since the global financial crisis and they would continue to trend lower. All the evidence is there, Bushy. I think this is a time we're going to be okay if you've done your homework uh, and you've bought well and, you, and you're able and prepared to hold on. This is going to be an okay year and a year full of opportunities. Yeah, and uh, Brentley said, mate, uh, as I say, no better person to talk to than you because you talk to all of the gurus and all the experts. So uh, uh, very privileged and humbled for you to take some of your very valuable time to, to download that for us, mate. And uh, look, uh, love what you do, mate, Property TV. Mate, if, if you've got a couple of minutes, I've got my top 10 points for things that I've learned. I'm, I'll, I yes. Have you got a minute? I'll just quickly uh, run through them. Yes, please, mate. Sorry <laughs> I didn't give you that opportunity. No, mate, no, that's fine. It's probably uh, just a bit of a summary on, on what I've already said, but I think these are my top 10 tips. And one is be the master of your own destiny. Be careful whose advice you follow. Uh, you know, make sure that you respect them. Uh, make your own decisions. Be the master of your own destiny. Don't it, it, certainly take all the information that comes in. Listen to our podcast. Listen to your podcast, Bushy. All the information you can get, but be prepared to make your own decisions. And more importantly, when you make a, a blue, own it. Learn from it. Learn from those mistakes and move on. Uh, be prepared to share. This is a big one, Louie. Um, you know, this has been my mantra for quite a long time. If you share, it's what you give out that's going to come back to you 10 times. Um, it is a great way to learn. Um, you know, talk to people like yourself, Bushy. You know, be prepared. If you've got some experience, offer to give it out. Um, because there'll be so much coming back. Always be learning. Be a student. Have an open mind. Um, always be looking for a better way to do things. Another one is build your network. And, and, and on this point, I'm not just talking about your network. Well, certainly build your network of, of influencers or people you want to talk to. Go and join groups. Um, you know, there are some tremendous groups that get together and share the information, which is what I was talking about. I think, too, Louie, build your team, but you've got to get serious about your team. And I think if you can treat them almost as like directors of your company, like your your, your bank, your solicitor, uh, your, your finance person, um, all the people, the um, evaluer, all of these people are so willing to uh, contribute to, to your success, get them involved in what you do. Think of them as a director. There's um, a couple of investors I know who they've got their their influences, their sphere. They meet with them once a month. Louis. They, they, they'll actually buy them lunch. They'll get them together around a boardroom table. They'll say, this is what I'm doing. This is where my business is going. Um, this is what my portfolio is doing. And it's a tremendous learning experience. You've got to look at this as a business. And the bottom one is uh, review and be ruthless. Just continue to continually review, look and, and monitor your plan. Mate, uh, some absolute gold there. Uh, that you know, the are lessons that uh, you've picked up over many years and talking to to many people. Uh, very pleased for you to share it. One thing I just w- I'd like to add to compliment that, mate. Uh, when we're talking about building your network and always learning and being prepared to share, you may have heard of the Property Investment Council of Australia, which is the new initiative that Ben yeah. Kingsley is driving. Uh, I've uh, been fortunate enough to uh, be given the job of driving the local advisory council here in South Australia. Uh, Good on you, Mark. Yeah, PICA, as it's been referred to, Property Investment Council of Australia, is going to be a group by property investors for property investors to both educate, inform each other, but also to start advocating to governments, banks and the general community on the benefits that uh, property investment actually brings to the broader economy, Kevin. And uh, yep. the membership's only five bucks a year, so it's it's a great way to start rubbing shoulders with like-minded people and learning from each other, and then starting to uh, you know have a voice that governments and others will start to have a listen to. So, mate, yep. uh, look, really appreciative of uh, you taking some of your busy time. I know you're catching a plane later to the states. And uh, I just want to wish you um, all your ongoing success with what you're doing uh, as chair of Switch Media. Uh, I just love what you're doing to help people really 
get the, the real information on what's happening in property finance in Australia and now globally, mate. So uh, uh, I know that'll continue to flourish for you and um, uh, would love to be able to stay in touch and talk to you further uh, on the odd occasion on similar subjects, mate. Yeah, mate. Look, I, and I really appreciate the opportunity to um, be a voice on your podcast too. Congratulations on what you're doing with Rob Bush. I think it's fantastic. And the more people we can get doing this, the more information we're going to get out. I was only talking to Margaret Lomas the other day and, um, you know, she said the whole reason she does everything she does is simply because she just wants the information to get out there for people to, you know, be educated, get the best possible information. So there's a whole group of us, mate, who are doing, you know, like you, um, you know, your heart's in the right spot, Bushy, and I love talking to you, mate. <laughs> yeah, Good likewise, mate. Yeah, same, mate. So you travel safe, mate. We'll keep in touch and... Uh uh, I'll be getting everyone to tune into Property TV and continue listening to Real Estate Talk on our Yarn Cup, mate. Hey, mate. Uh, yeah, just before you, I always like to have the last word, Bushy. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you, mate. <laughs> I just want to give you a Warren Buffett quote, which is one I've dug out for you because I know you're a great believer in, in what he says. When the tide goes out, you'll know this one, you discover who's been swimming naked. Just make sure it's not you. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> See you, mate. See you, buddy. Bye. Mmm, some very sobering thoughts there from Kevin. And as always, despite the caution, there's still plenty of opportunity for those that take his wisdom to heart and stick to the fundamentals. Let's turn to another view now. And I'd love to share with you the highly qualified thoughts on the year ahead from Josh Masters. Now, Josh is an active investor himself who has turned his personal passion and success in property into an award-winning and highly regarded buyer's agency business called Buyside that helps property purchasers nationally to find, negotiate and secure the best available property to meet your needs. He's also author of the highly acclaimed book, Why Property, Why Now? Now, what I really admire and respect about Josh is that his thoughts are always based on facts, not gut feelings. He relies on in-depth, independent information from very trusted research houses. And his interpretation and insights are absolutely second to none, and they're delivered in a down-to-earth, very easy to understand, warm and friendly way. So please have a great listen to Josh Masters. So Freedom Fighters, what's in store from a property buyer's perspective this year? To get an informed and objective opinion from a very highly respected industry leader, We've got the pleasure of welcoming back Josh Masters. Now, Josh, for those who remember, is the author of Why Property, Why Now? And he's the founder of Buyside, a buyer's agency that sources, negotiates and secures the best properties to suit buyer's property strategies nationally. Now, in the current climate, there are many uneducated and misinformed claims of gloom and doom in the mainstream press, and these are countered by many contrasting and varying views by industry specialists. So, Josh Masters, welcome back to Get Invested. What's your overall view of how the property market's going to perform in 2019, mate? Thanks for having me, Bushy. Um, look, 2019 is going to be interesting. Uh, there's, there's no question where I, I think we you know, let's call a state of spade. There's a few headwinds we're going to be facing. Um, first of all, Sydney and Melbourne have definitely come off their peaks. Uh, we saw, you know, probably negative 9%, negative 7% respectively for Sydney and Melbourne over the last 12 months. So their trajectory is currently downwards and they're probably accounting for, you know, the majority of what we see in the marketplace today in terms of movement. Um, but then we've got a number of other influences that are going to be playing, playing out in the first six months of 2019, namely... Uh, the uh, the second report, second of two reports um, from the Hain Royal Commission will be uh, published in, in February. Uh, we don't know what's going to be in that in terms of uh, the, the Royal Commission sort of pulling banks into line. And I, I feel it's probably going to be more in line with uh, remuneration uh, for, for bankers and, and how that's paid out and how they're incentivised rather than... Um, uh, the impact it will have on the marketplace uh, that are already being put in place by banks um, for consumers already in terms of lending. Yeah. So I think it's more of a, 
it's, it's going to affect confidence more than anything to see banks back in the media come February and getting, you know, well, no one's going to be giving them a gold star, let's face it. It's going to be a bit of bank bashing there. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So we got, we're probably going to see a little bit of that. Obviously, the election two to three months post that, uh, it's got to, be, got to be handled prior to May. So, uh, you know, that's going to be looming. And, and generally, I don't know if, how many uh, investors out there have been in the marketplace for, for that long, but generally what we see coming up to an election is that the population, when it comes to investing and, and doing things like that, they tend to uh, sit on their hands. Uh, confidence, it doesn't fall, but, but people almost hold their breath because they don't know what's coming. In the reality is not really a lot changes once the election happens, but because people want to know who's in power, uh, for those months leading up to it, not a lot happens. So I wouldn't expect too much to happen in the marketplace uh, in terms of growth. Like no one's going to be out there spending spending like the, you know, the, the bejesus anyway. So... I think that's probably a headwind that we're going to be facing as well. Yep. And, um, you know, tougher lending restrictions. Uh, Bushy, you probably know more than anybody being a mortgage broker as well, that banks are scrutinising uh, the, the expenses of, of borrowers more than uh, any time that I've ever seen it. Yep. They are going through it with a fine-tooth comb, and that has been in response to APRA's uh, regulations being put apart in the marketplace some time ago, as well as the, the, the Royal Commission waving the stick and the banks going, you know what, we need to pull ourselves into line just to make sure everything's, um, you know, squeaky clean before anything is placed upon us that, that we don't really want and, and that we're going to get a bad rap for. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's good call, mate. The, uh, yeah, just sort of uh, adding some colour to what you're saying there, uh, the... The, the latest impact that will affect all borrowers, not just investors, but all borrowers, is the uh, focus on elevating uh, living expense treatment. Mm. And it's now going to be actual living expenses, not estimates or benchmarks. Yes. And the, yeah. the really quick takeaway home there, mate, is that the banks are now looking at the actual last six months transaction statements for all applicants and they will average those out and use those. So if you've had a massive Christmas and you've gone overseas and you've spent big <laughs> and you've, you've lashed out yeah. and spoilt the kids, that's going to bite hard on how yeah. much the banks will then let you borrow. And, and then in addition to that, uh, what people mightn't be quite aware of is that conduct now will be absolutely critical. So, you know, a day late paying the home loan or one cent unpaid every month on the credit card will knock you out. So uh, okay. it's, wow. it's going to be absolutely crucial to keep your conduct crystal clean and also to make sure that that expenditure is kept uh, you know, as low as possibly can in the six-month lead-up to when you're actually going to secure a property or, or even refinance a loan for that matter. So, you know, interesting, mate. Any other thoughts around things that will influence uh, the market other than what you've covered off there? Well, I think... Um it was interesting you talked about earlier the, the the fact that people can get pulled into these stories of, of um, you know, we're all kind of doomed. And if I was following that rhetoric, I'd probably stop the conversation there and because I've only given you the bad points. But <laughs> the, the truth is, life goes on and the market goes on and there's people out there buying property today. Markets out there doing quite well but no one wants to talk about them because it doesn't sell newspapers, let's be frank. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we've got to take a look at these influences and say, okay, uh, what are these influences having on the marketplace and how is it changing buyers' behaviour? That's, that's what you've got to ask. Yeah. First of all, lending restrictions we know are in place already and people are being bought back on their buying capacities. We know that's in place. We know that interest-only lending uh, has been capped for some time. It's now uh, recently been lifted. But investors are paying interest rates that are, that are higher than the homeowners. That's yeah. the reality of the marketplace right now. So yeah. banks are bashing investors a little bit. So we know that's, uh, that's in play. So we've got to ask ourselves, how will we react to that? And where we're seeing markets that are doing quite well are the markets that, 
appeal to almost the flip side of what's happening. So, for example, uh, those uh, markets that appeal to homeowners are doing reasonably well in parts. Yep. Uh, those markets that are at the more affordable end are uh, doing much better than the ones that are really at the top end. Like if, if I came to you and uh, maybe two years ago I could get a million dollars, now I can only get 600000 because of uh, my limited buying capacity, then I'm going to be out there looking for property at 600000 Yeah. The million dollar properties are not even on my radar anymore. So, you know, you're going to places like, you know, Sydney's eastern suburbs, which, you know, everybody might like, and it's a really blue chip area and consistently probably performs quite well on 10 to 20 years growth rates. But no one's going to be paying $1.3 million for a two-bedroom unit. I've got doctors coming to me, uh, obviously on very, very good incomes, talking about three to $400,000 properties. Now, that's the reality because everybody's expenses and, and uh, approvals are getting looked at with a fine-tooth comb and they're being brought back and they want to reduce their risk and they're a little bit uncertain how the market will perform and quite frankly, some of the best performing markets right now are those down the bottom end. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, no, it's absolutely spot on, mate. And it's, uh, I guess it's uh, uh, reinforcing our, our belief that you always should be investing in the sweet spot in that, in that uh, medium priced area where people can always mm-hmm. afford to buy, always afford to rent, and uh, then providing all the other... Uh, value drivers are there, then regard, you're sort of insulating yourself to some degree from, from some of those headwinds from political interventions or, or market change. Yeah, and look, to, to jump in on some of those other influences, Bushy, um, I think on a, you, you can probably look at a more on neutral levels. Uh, you know, where the Australian dollar is and where inflation is plays a big impact on where interest rates ride. And I know... A lot of people have, I mean, we've seen one of the most consistent sort of rates stabilised, you know, for, for oh, I, can't, I can't remember how long it is now, but at one at 1.5% uh, from the RBA on a cash rate. Now, there was talk earlier of that cash rate going up, but now there's talk of that, that cash rate actually coming down in response to, you know, a, a break-even level of inflation and and the exchange rate moving. So we may actually see, you know, because like everything, that's, there's, there's ups and downs, because of such tightening in the, in the credit market, the housing, nobody wants to see the housing market crash. No. Construction's already taken, you know, a, 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 um, a downward turn in terms of how much is being built in the economy right now. And construction's one of our major uh, economic drivers. Um, we want to see the markets flattening out somewhat. So there'll be people in top offices right now going, you know, how do we soften the blow in some of these markets? Uh, credit's obviously too tight. How do we let that go a little bit? And the first thing that they've, they've said is APRA's turned around and said, look, um, you know, the, the cap on in interest-only loans, uh, we're willing to, to let that go. We think it's been very effective up to this point, but now we need to release it. Uh, and I think we'll start to see more of that in 2019. We'll see the uh, the powers that be reacting to these market forces going, you know what, we're, we're too far into this tightening. It needs to let up a little bit. And we may actually see an interest rate drop. Um, we may see credit uh, regulations loosening up li- a little bit. For example, uh, they won't be assessing loans at seven percent anymore. Maybe they'll only assess them at five percent. Um, it's it's difficult to say, but that's probably where I see it heading. Yeah, I agree. And, and let's face, banks are businesses, mate, who have shareholders that need a return, and uh, that's they, right. They've been exactly. under very tight scrutiny. And you know, I've, I've heard figures quoted that sixty percent of the revenue of a bank comes from the home loan books. Uh, in, yes. with some of the majors. So they will be hurting yeah. right now. And while they'll remain squeaky clean until the final report on the Royal uh, Commission on Banking gets tabled in February and there'll be a little bit of a flow on from there, we've seen the major, the policy tightening happen already. But the demands of business will mean that the banks will need to start writing more loans. So later in the year, I, I agree with you, I think the first six months when you throw the election in on top of the Royal Commission 
and the access to credit is going to be pretty tight. We'll start to see a relaxing, a little bit more confidence back in once we know who's going to be in government, what they're doing, and and the access to money's there. So from you know being a contrarian mate myself, uh, I actually see this next six months. If you're in a position to be able to do something now, is going to be a really good time to take advantage of it. So um, I, I do. So I totally agree. And I, I think you, you're spot on there with the, the fact that this, the, the next six months or the first six months of 2019 is going to be shaky, I think. Um, but we're going to see banks really responding and getting very, very competitive, fighting for market share that they probably lost over the last, you know, come then, six to 12 months. Uh, so the second half of 2019 will be very interesting. But you're right. Uh, if you if you can get hold of money right now, there are some great opportunities out there to, to get in and buy because you know the whole idea. No one wants to buy at the top of the market. We're really looking for undervalued stock here. So it's about doing the research, finding out where prices are more depressed than than any, and, and where there's good upside uh, potential coming through. And that's where you really want to get in right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, I'll, we'll dig into that in a minute and what your thoughts on, on what those mm. locations we go around the grounds. But let, let's just uh, a quick deep dive on the election, mate. Uh, let, let's assume for a minute uh, that uh, federally the Labor government gets in and they uh, st- go down the road of instituting their fairly significant changes to negative yeah. gearing and capital gains tax, which, you know, at earliest will probably come in with the budget or, or middle of... 2020 by the time they get their act together. Yeah. What's your view on uh, the impact and what, if anything, can or should people be doing about it? Okay, so um, there have been some really thorough reports done on this and I, I think you're aware uh, that, that RiskWise and, and Pete Wardgen did a combined report on on the floor and, and they did, or on the, on the I should say, the... Um, the impact of the negative gearing changes on the marketplace, uh, they said that uh, it would be detrimental for the market uh, with price falls of up to 10% in some places uh, on top of current market movements. So so that was in addition to, uh, yeah. if you've seen, you know, Sydney and Melbourne right now at, at you know, 7 to 9% uh, negative, uh, then they're saying, well, in some of those areas in, in Sydney and Melbourne, we could see greater falls. We could see up to another 10% on top of that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it's a very real uh, cause for concern in in some areas, and especially those that are, that are very much investment-driven. And that's why I go back to, you know, looking at, at markets that won't be t- uh, tainted by that, and, and the, the homeowner market is one of those. Um, you know, on top of that, we've got capital gains tax uh, potentially being brought back. No one really prices that in because it's kind of a future thing. It's if you have to sell, yes, we may not get as much as we thought, which is obviously a, a downside. Um, look, I'm I'm not, uh, you know, probably around the economic conditions as much as I would like to be like uh, people like RiskWise, you know, they're quantitative analysis guys. They know their stuff inside out, and I would prefer to, re- uh, you know, rely on their research uh, yeah. rather than me as, a, you know, just in my my own and, and the, the work yeah. that we do in our department. Yeah. Um, and if they're saying that, that that's the way it's headed, then then I'd probably have to agree with them and say, look, it's not, it's not great. Um, where I do see some interesting avenues is, is first of all, uh, they will probably grandfather the negative gearing allowances. So if, if you're buying within the next six months, let's say, prior to the election, uh, those tax benefits are up for grabs right now. Yeah. You'd be crazy to be waiting, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, you might see falls of t- up to 10% in investor-driven markets that aren't well chosen. But if you choose well and you buy today, the great tax benefits that we're all privy to right now are still in play and you will have those for the life of the investment. Yep. So I would say, you know, grab it while it's hot. Um, the other thing I would say is that there's an interesting push towards, and, and this is part of Labor's uh, policy, there's an interesting push to to uh, um, take the new property stock 
out of this equation. So new property will not uh, will still attract the negative gearing components. And as we were, you know, uh, exposed to a couple of years back at the budget, they removed depreciation. But they only removed the depreciation component on the fittings and fixtures for established property. They still kept it for new property. Yep. So all of a sudden, you know, this new property stock that's coming into the market is becoming more and more appealing. And, and I think this will change the way investors in particular are looking at investment product. No longer will it, the established market be as attractive. It will still be attractive. But new stock will be is becoming more and more attractive, and and you know we're looking at that sort of thing, you know, forward thinking for for our business right now as to what investors will be be looking for. I think that will be uh, a real boon for people who want to get into the market. They're still going to get their negative gearing. They're still going to get full depreciation allowances on new on new property. And if you choose well in a good suburb. You know, it's very hard to lose on something like that, Bushy. You know, you're getting good growth, you're getting tax breaks, uh, and you're getting, uh, you know, tax breaks on depreciation and your negative gearing. Like, it's a bit of a no-brainer, really, I think. Absolutely, mate. I'd, I'd be talking to the converted here, because as you know, uh, for the last decade, uh, we've, both personally and with the investors that we look after, uh, we've favoured new build properties in mm. high-demand infill locations and it's not difficult through clever structuring and utilising those uh, tax benefits uh, to use negative gear and to create a, a cash flow neutral or, or cash flow positive result on a, a property that's cost you somewhere between four fifty and 700000 bucks. So yeah. uh, we're big supporters of, of that and you're absolutely right, it's going to drive a much stronger need and demand in that area. And uh, which will be great for the building fraternity, and uh, I think that's all in recognition that all governments at all levels know we've got a ongoing housing shortage as a result of population growth, as a result of yes, smaller family right. sizes, and the fact that we're all living fifteen odd years longer than what we used to, mate. So, yeah, yeah. no, that, that, that's and that, there's a, a real opportunity there, I think, as far as that goes. But, mate, uh, t- let's talking about opportunities then, uh, and if if. If you're an investor that's looking for long-term capital growth, which which most of the investing fraternity are, where mm. are the opportunities as you see it uh, securing property over the next 12 months? Well, <laughs> it's a good question, Bushy, and it, and it comes, it's a bit of a, it's a statement with a bit of dichotomy about it because if you're looking over the next 12 months, uh, I think it's going to be the rise of the little guys. You know, we've seen the juggernauts of Sydney and Melbourne doing their thing for five years plus, now coming off the boil uh, in a, you know, well-publicised way. Uh, and people are hoping, you know, the trajectory downwards is, is not very much further and it's going to flatten out for some. But I think it's going to be areas like, uh, you know, like Brisbane, the Gold Coast area, southeast Queensland, areas like, uh, you know, Hobart's been doing... You know, phenomenally well. I think they're going to probably um, plateau out in in this year and probably into the next. I know a number of other um, uh, commentators have said the same thing. QBE Outlook has, has said the same thing. Um, places like Canberra, places like Adelaide, and you know, I'll be quite honest. We're actually looking at Perth now. It's it's been long enough. Perth has has been um, smashed beyond belief uh, in terms of prices from it, from its previous highs. And now there is actually some good buying there. And, yep. you know, it's, it's difficult for a lot of people. And I know you mentioned you were a contrarian investor, which means that you're investing against the grain. You're investing when, when other people are, are not investing there. And this is a time where, you know, you need to, um, you know, hold on tight and look at these markets seriously that have underperformed to the, to such an extent that now there's actually some really interesting value there provided the economic drivers are coming up behind it to support it in terms of jobs growth and population growth, etc. Yeah. So they're the sort of indicators that we're looking at which are, are driving us to say, you know what, these smaller major metro capitals 
are, are actually, I think it's their time to shine in 2019. Yeah, I absolutely agree, and I'd, I've been watching Perth pretty closely for a while now, and there's still still a reasonable, reasonable vacancy take-up, so it's, it might be slightly premature, but uh, if you look at what's happening, uh, sort of quietly bubbling away, the resource sector has recovered pretty substantially, which, you know, is a strong driver of what's happening in WA. And, uh, you know, I've, I've got family over in that neck of the woods, and they've seen a pleasing turnaround in the the value of uh, property for them personally so I, I agree with you mate uh, if you're taking a, a minimum 10 but more likely 15 or 20 horizon on your investment strategy then Perth and areas of WA represent uh, very good opportunities at the moment now that's yeah, awesome, I, 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 I do have to preface that and say it is uh, you know I, I've mentioned Perth and I, I'm, I'm very cautious about mentioning Perth because you know, for investors out there looking for, for the next spot to invest, I would say, look, it's an aggressive strategy if you're looking there. Um, there are a lot of indicators that, that I mean, it's still in negative territory, yep. but it, it is starting to show signs of, of potential growth. You know, if you wanted something a little bit more um, almost, uh, you know, consistent and, and, and a, almost a sure thing, you know, South East Queensland right now is, is showing positive growth when others uh, are falling, you know, well into the negative territory. Yeah. And I think there's some really good drivers there. Um, Adelaide's had, you know, some resurgent uh, major contracts, uh, one and, and some good upgrades, you know, around the, the, uh, the port area uh, that are attracting some good employment opportunities. And, and now some of those markets are starting to attract a lot more auction activity than, than we've been used to seeing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I definitely think, think there's some gems in the rough there for uh, for investors who are willing to look or at least tap into, you know, people like uh, you or I who, who have access to the research that that uh, will deliver on it. Totally agree, mate. I, I think South East Queensland and uh, pockets of Adelaide have been the the quiet achievers for quite some time, and will continue to be because uh, all the factors. I've, I've actually almost been surprised that we haven't seen. Because uh, South East Queensland's been primed for a while now, and yes, there are mm. there are areas that are experiencing uh, incremental growth, but I think it's extremely well poised, and similarly in pockets in and around Adelaide for the, the very reasons that you've mentioned, mate. So, uh, and I guess uh, again, I'm I'm uh, traditionally haven't been a New South Wales or or Melbourne. Uh, uh, investor because most of our clients uh, are looking at price points well below that so I've tended to focus mm-hmm. on those peripheral regions where there's affordability but but strong growth drivers mate so now awesome mate uh, the, the one we've left out is the territory of course what's what's your view of the top end uh, the top end is a bit uh, it's a bit shaky for me I'm not seeing I'm not seeing the the, the economic drivers there or any such signs of them coming into the area like we saw in the past where we had the, the last boom, uh, especially with defence and gas, uh, we're just not seeing that in the Territory right now and, and you know, it's still suffering. It's suffering a lot more than Perth was. I think Perth is starting to, um, it, it's raced ahead of Darwin where they both went into sort of that mining glut. Uh, Perth seems to have, have come out a little bit better than Darwin at the moment and, and you know, they're still... Uh, very high vacancy rates. There's, there's reasonable re- rental yields there, but but very high vacancy rates. Um, you know, values are, are, are so so. So uh, for me, there's there's nothing on the horizon in this next twelve months that that is making me um, get excited for Darwin. No. And we've got to keep in mind, you know, this this market, the property market. It's not like the stock market. It doesn't change on a dime. Things have to be put in place. Uh, Contracts come in, arrangements are made, people start to to get a feel for the area, then they start to invest. It's a very slow process. or It, it can feel fast sometimes when you're not on top of it, but compared to things like the stock market, we, don't, we just don't see things turn around in three months. So, you know, if there's nothing on the horizon right now uh, for, for places like Darwin, then we may not see significant activity, you know, until maybe 2020. Yeah, no, I... I... Absolutely agree, and I think one of the challenges that the top end's always had from a growth perspective, because cash flow is a little bit different, you, the, the yields you mentioned, if you pick up the properties cheaply enough and you're not borrowing, they are good yielding 
properties from a cash flow perspective. But mm. if you're looking for growth, they just don't have the critical mass or the diversification of industries and therefore employment that, no. that support that sustainable long-term growth that most investors are looking for. So, so yeah, mate, so that's awesome. Now, uh, I guess just trying to boil that down then into, okay, well, given all of that, uh, what should property owners be doing this year? And let's let's break it down into home buyers, investors, and home sellers, mate. What are what are your views on what each of those groups uh, should or need to be doing or not doing in the following twelve months? So uh, I'll, I'll keep it simple and just give a couple of points. Uh, if you're a home buyer, I think. Realistically, our market that are, that are listening right now, they're probably going to be based in either Sydney or Melbourne, uh, as probabilities would have it. So I would say if you're buying a home right now, uh, it's a, it is a it is a great time to buy. Uh, but my motto here would be negotiate hard, know your values, and push um, for the best price possible. If you were buying in Sydney today, you may see... Prices fall another five percent. Now, I wouldn't worry about that. You know, myself, I'd be looking at that long-term perspective. And in five years' time, you're going to look back at this this year and you're thinking, you know, I'd be mad if I didn't buy this year because it was such a yeah. it was such good pricing. Yeah. But you have to, you, you can't take just what the sales agent's giving you at face value, uh, and don't believe the hype that the market's picking up right now because it's if, if anything, it's flatlining. If not you know, declining a little. Yeah. So know your prices, have a look have a look at past sales and drive hard on negotiations. And I always say, look, if you have if you can have uh, another choice up your sleeve to, to fall back on, uh, that's an even better way to win a, a great price in a negotiation. Um, for investors I would say uh, look at the trends and the influences uh, that are affecting the market. Uh, lending restrictions are bringing borrowing capacity down, um, uh, making it you know those, end, those ends of the market that are more affordable, much more appealing. Uh, the investors' uh, market right now is getting smashed by the banks. So the more appealing market is towards those types of properties that appeal to homeowners. It's also better from a defensive point of view. You know, the adage that you say around, you know, people always need a place to live, that's true, but only for homeowners. The investors, if they need to get rid of something that it's in a high investor area, they don't mind flicking it for a low price. As we saw, uh, you know, in places like the mining towns, people got in trouble because there were no other homeowners to sell to. It was just an investor-driven market. Yeah. Now, if you're selling uh, in this market, which is your third group, uh, I would say uh, maybe reconsider. <laughs> yeah. You know, only sell if you have to uh, right now. And... Uh, don't look at a gift horse in the mouth. Don't be greedy. Uh, take what you can get um, because what you might find is that prices may fall further uh, and you don't want to be sitting there in six months' time going, you know, I wish we had sold for, for something that was reasonable. Um, be realistic with prices. I think that's the danger that most sellers face in any market is that they, they go into a situation uh, looking at what, you know, Mr. Jones got next door six months ago and it's a very different market today than it was six months ago or even three months ago in yeah. Sydney and Melbourne. So just keep that in mind. Yeah, I think that's a good call. I think the, the, the only glimmer for me, mate, in the, in the selling property arena is if you're like most, buyers, uh, most uh, property sellers, you're looking to then buy something else, then mm. uh, again... Uh, the changeover costs are probably unlikely to be uh, as small as this for some time once the markets start to get back into their growth phase. So, uh, you know, it's good buying. Uh, yes, you might take a little bit of a clip on the on the sale compared to what it might have been 12 months ago, but on on the other side of that, you're, you're going to be buying a property yet at a really good time. So it's, yeah. that, it's that changeover situation for me, for those that are in that, position that would, it wouldn't daunt me at all. If, if you are just selling the property and you're not looking to get back into the market, then yes, it might be a time to sit tight uh, unless you really have to sell until things uh, uh, solidify later in the year. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And look, so, it's, it's, yeah. It, I'll just add, add to that, Bushy, I think 
it's uh, it's another thing to say, you know, a lot more people are considering uh, the fact that, you know, maybe home ownership is not the right time at the moment. Uh, it doesn't mean that you have to stay out of the marketplace. The, the, the rent vesting trend is, is alive and well. Um, if you pick the right areas to, to invest in and the right properties, it doesn't mean you have to stay out of the market just because the market's declining in your area. You can remain flexible, keep renting, and and look for other opportunities in the marketplace nationally. Uh, and you know, Sydney's a perfect example of that. We're seeing a glut of rentals coming into the marketplace right now. Rental vacancies have just hit three and a half percent. There's more than enough uh, properties to look at if you want to rent and you can drive hard on the rental price Mm -hmm. which means then you can then take your money and invest it in the marketplace elsewhere in those areas that are showing some opportunity like we've talked about today and you can benefit in both ways and come back to when when the market's uh, a little bit more confident. Yeah, that's brilliant advice, mate. I I can say from first-hand experience uh, that uh, my good wife Sonia and I – enabled us to put ourselves in a strong position by rent vesting uh, for many years uh, and taking advantage of really good properties at, at, at rents that were way below what they would be if we had to take out a mortgage and put our, all our capacity into, into uh, properties where uh, yeah. we could get into and enjoy the, the ride on capital growth and structure them so it wasn't costing us anything to hold. And I, I think the, the smart operators now are accessing lifestyle through rent and investing in uh, ownership in uh, properties that are uh, tax effectively uh, going to be affordable and in, increase their wealth over time, mate. So I think that's a yeah, r- really good, um, really good suggestion there, mate. So you, just to sum up, then, mate, if you were to, to bring it down to boil it down to the 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 overview, what's the take home? Uh, mate, I, I'm uh, I'm uh, I would say the overview. Sorry, I'm struggling to hear just a little bit. Your, um, I, can, I can hear the dog well, but uh, you're just <laughs> up a little. <laughs> Sorry, mate. Can um, you hear me now? Was yeah. it an overview for 2019? Yeah, just a summary overview, mate. Yeah, look, as a summary overview, I would say uh, t- um, uh, getting to the property investing uh, before Shorten comes into, into power, which is almost a given at the moment. Uh, so take advantage of those negative gearing allowances, but look at where the trends are for the influences that are impacting the market right now. And it is more attractive to be down the bottom end of the market. There are some great opportunities in the cheaper end of town and especially in those smaller metro, major metro areas like, um, you know, Adelaide, South East Queensland, uh, possibly Canberra as well if you if you can uh, weather the land taxes. Um, but there are some really good, there's some good buying there right now. I think that's where we will see the growth for 2019. So don't let it scare you as long as you've got the money. Yeah, no, awesome, mate. Uh, a great summary. Uh, one final thing I'll just mention for those listeners who uh, haven't got across, and I have been talking about it quite a bit lately, uh, there, has, there is a independent uh, group that's now been formed nationally to look after the interests of property investors, which is the Property Investment Council of Australia, or PICA, as it's referred to. Ben Kingsley is, is driving that. Uh, I'm helping drive the uh, membership base here in South Australia, but as a as a group that finally will form a voice where uh, it's a safe place to go and share experience and learn good quality information without being sold to, a great fraternity, but also as an advocate group to represent the 2.2 million uh, mums and dad property investors across the country. There's no better and no greater need at this stage when banks are villainising investors and the federal government's about to make some pretty wholesale changes that, while they're targeted investors, will impair and restrict every homeowner in the country. Uh, For a $5 membership, which is all it is, mate, uh, I'd be encouraging everyone to get on board with PICA. Its website's picker.asn.au. $5 will get you on board. And uh, finally, we'll start advocating and uh, educating the, the broader community, banks and the government on the benefits that property investors bring to the economy overall. So, awesome, mate. Look, uh, okay, really appreciate mate. you taking the time, mate. Uh, we'll be in touch, but uh, your insights are always um, on the money and straight down the line. So, uh, I know people will take a lot from that, mate, and uh, appreciate you taking a little bit of time out of your busy day. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave.
Thank you, Bushy. Thanks for having me. Thanks, mate. Hmm, well, some great thoughts this week on the national scene from Kevin Turner and Josh Masters. They've both been extremely generous with both their time and their insights. But Get Invested Insights don't end here. Over the next couple of weeks, we will complete our look at the year ahead with commentary from leading South Australian real estate agent Scott McFarlane, together with my own conclusions and thoughts on property and finance this year and what you need to be doing to optimise your position. In the meantime, there are three other things that will really help your journey. Firstly, grab yourself a copy of my book, The Freedom Formula, if you haven't read it already, as this puts the entire journey in context so that you've got a basis to really measure industry movements and make really good, fully informed and well-informed decisions. You can get it on Amazon or Booktopia, or you can jump on bushymartin.com.au and register for a copy there if that's easier. Now, secondly, a great way to kick off the year regardless of what you're doing is to put an extra $400 to $1,000 a month back in your pocket by just refinancing your home loan. Now, if you do this with us, the team here at Know How will make sure that for every dollar that we save you, we're going to be giving one day of life-saving water to those in absolutely desperate need in Ethiopia through B1, G1 or Business for Good. Now, our goal here is a big and audacious one. We want to be able to give one million days of life-saving water by June 30. So we're really going to need your help to refinance loans for your friends, your family and your colleagues. We're currently only on about 98,000 days, so we've got a massive amount of work to do if we're going to hit that target. And we'd really love you to help us in that. And lastly, if you really want to get things going, you can book into our next information session by registering at hello at khgroup.com.au. That's H-E-L-L-O at khgroup.com.au. And just pop Freedom Fighters in the subject heading. Well, I hope that's been useful to you. You enjoy a fantastic week and I'll be into your ears hopefully at similar time next week. Bye for now.